Hi guys! Today I'd like to talk through my birth story in a little bit more detail. So if you're interested to hear about what really happened, and I mean what really happened, keep watching! On the 23rd of December 2015, I was sitting in our study with Mike and I was actually making a little Christmas stocking for my cat Oreo, which I'm sure sounds like a real crazy cat lady thing to do, and it is. But it was funny, whilst I was making it, Mike made a joke saying, are you going to make one for Baby Thunder? And I said, no, don't be silly. He's not due to arrive until the 9th of January. So why would I make him a stocking when he's not going to be here for Christmas? Within about five minutes at exactly 9.58 p.m., my waters broke. Now, I had a sort of a little bit of a warning waters breaking moment a week before or possibly even four days before where I started leaking some water. Oh God, it sounds really disgusting, but it just felt like my undies were a bit wet. And so I called the hospital, this, is, this was the week prior, and I said to them, I think my waters have broken. And they asked me how much, and I said, look, it was probably about a tablespoon. And then they go ahead and tell you to pop a pad on and to just have a look at um, and keep an eye on how much water continues to leak. If your waters are broken, then they, it, it definitely would just keep flowing. It wouldn't just be a teaspoon here and there, unless you've got a tear. So did that a couple a week ago and nothing else eventuated from it. On the night of the 23rd, when my waters actually broke, that was for real. I mean, it was a gush. It felt like a liter of water had just decided to exit my body. And I stood up, literally walked to the laundry, which is just across the way from the study, and just said to Mike, I think my waters have broken and both of our faces were literally just like we had no idea what to do um, we we're running around like crazy little ants going oh my gosh oh my gosh um, until I think one of us had the sense to go okay contact the hospital let them know what's happened so Mike got his phone called the hospital and she uh, the maternal um, or oh, sorry the midwife spoke to me and said okay Let's talk about what your waters look like. Are you in pain, etc. At this point, I was in absolutely no pain. It was just more shock that uh, this was actually happening, which actually kind of made me cast a bit of doubt over the whole thing, whether I was in labor, because my preconception of it was that you need to be in pain first and then your waters break for some reason. But um, no, it didn't happen that way for me. But if you girls, uh, go into labor without your waters breaking, that's absolutely normal. At this point in time, the midwife said to me, okay, lovely, time to pack your bags and bring them to hospital because we're going to admit you. And I think Mike and I just about flipped out with excitement. The next couple of minutes were spent doing totally irrelevant activities. I stacked the dishwasher, <laughs> Mike continued to make his cake for the next five minutes and make sure that that was all set and all blended and cooked and all sorts of things like that. I think I went into uh, the bathroom, I went into Ted's nursery, I went into the bedroom three or four times with no particular purpose except just to walk in and out of the room. So. However you decide to cope with the excitement slash, I guess, you know, um, emotions of that moment, just live in it, make it happen. In about 10 minutes or so, we had the hospital bag packed. Thank God I'd had that packed only a few days prior. So a lot of women were telling me, pack your hospital bags at week 35. I have to now say in hindsight, that would have been a really good idea. Instead I packed mine at 37 weeks so just make sure girls just have it all ready to go because it's the last thing you really want to worry about when the time comes. Within 10 minutes we were in the car. This would have been close to maybe 10.30. We were driving to the hospital which was only a 15 to 20 minute drive away and if you'd watched my actual vlog on the birth story and the journey, you would see that I was really excited, looking pretty tired, looking pretty drained already, 
because it was quite late and naturally 10.30 for a prego woman at 37 weeks was bedtime. I still wasn't experiencing pain, I was just more so wondering what was going to happen once I got to hospital. So as soon as I got to hospital, I had to fill in a bunch of paperwork. They showed me straight into a room, a birthing suite room, which was huge. It probably could have housed about 20 people, but it was good because it felt as though it didn't feel cramped. It felt as though I had room to walk around. There was a private ensuite as well where I could take a shower if things got quite serious and I needed some pain relief. There was a lovely little recliner for Mike to sit on slash sleep on if he had to and a TV and then of course a whole heap of hospital equipment. Once I was in hospital they strapped me onto a monitor and they put uh, two monitors on my tummy which you would have seen in the vlog as well and one of them measured the heartbeat, one of them measured my contractions and that's just the way that we sat for the next hour waiting and just assessing how things were going. Teddy's heartbeat was doing really well and my contractions again hadn't started so at that point the midwife actually gave me and Mike the option to go home try and get some sleep and we also contacted my obstetrician and told her what was going on at that point she said go home guys come back tomorrow morning on Christmas Eve at 7 30 a.m. and at that point in time we're going to put an oxytocin drip into your uh, in, into me and would effectively start the labor process otherwise known as being induced. So we knew at that point we were going to have Teddy Poon on the 24th of December and it was just blissful. I think all of us, well, Mike and I were just so excited and it was always going to be a really hard task to fall asleep and get some rest. Once we got home I double checked my hospital bag so I did have a chance to do that to make sure that I had everything I needed in the bag and that's one thing I think about a natural labour is that you do have time hopefully to do some of this double checking etc if you're not told to stay in hospital the night before so I settled myself into bed and by this time it was well and truly I think past midnight so I was quite exhausted ready for bed but the annoying thing was I couldn't actually get to sleep because my waters were still leaking a lot. So it was filling up pads and pads and you know it was just a horrible feeling. Now I know why kids bawl their eyes out when they wet their pants because it actually just felt disgusting and wet the whole time. And then lo and behold at 3am I tapped Mike on the shoulder and I said to him, babe, I think I just felt my first contraction and I wasn't quite sure if it was or if it was just a really strong period type cramp but regardless I found out that's what the contraction is in the early stages. Uh, within about 15 minutes I then got another wave, another contraction and I knew then to start timing my contractions and thank God we went to those birthing classes, the ones that I complained about all through my weekly updates but the one thing I did get from them was to time my contractions. So all I did was use the stopwatch on the iPhone and use the lap uh, feature. And so I could then track how much time there was in between contractions. They say that as soon as your contractions get to five, four or five minutes apart at 30 seconds long, that's when it's time to get to hospital. My contractions were all over the shop. They started at five minutes, then they went to 10 minutes, then they went to two minutes and they lasted five seconds and they lasted a minute. Oh gosh, it was just so hard to actually track where I was at with it all. Okay, so sorry, slight interruption. I've got little Teddy with me now. He just woke up for a little feed, but we're just gonna continue to tell your story, aren't we Teddy? Once we decided that we were going to hospital, it was pretty serene. I took a long hot shower and Mike made us some cups of tea and I just really took it all in. It was a really lovely moment where I think Mike and I just sort of sat in the kitchen for a little bit and just went, wow, this is the last moment that we're really here is just Mike and I in this house without a little baby in the house. And we just took it all in. It was just starting to 
uh, become quite light outside so the sunrise was happening and it was such a great moment to take stock of what was going to happen today well on the 24th of December. Once we got to hospital we went to the same room that we did the night before. They held the room for us and I was back on the monitors. The midwife from the night before was still there and she was just finishing up her shift so it was nice to be able to kind of say thanks to her for the support throughout the night. And by this time it was probably about 6 a.m. and I was told that my OBS was gonna come in about 8 to 8.30 to check on me and to basically get things started. I was fairly certain at this point that I wouldn't need an oxytocin drip um, or to be induced because my contractions were happening pretty quickly and they were all, you know, while still very sporadic, it was definitely getting quite full on. And, you know, Mike just made himself comfortable. We just sat there and had a bit of a chat. We watched a bit of TV. Um, I think I watched a bit of YouTube. I Instagrammed a little bit. We might have vlogged a bit more. The time went quite quickly, even though I was experiencing pain every five to 10 minutes. Once the pain got quite intense, so once it started to kind of really build, um, Mike was there watching the monitor and you could sort of see the numbers go up and up and up and then it would peak and then it would come down. And as the numbers went up, um, you know, Mike was really lovely. He was rubbing my back, he was spraying my face with this um, rose spray that I brought along with me and getting me lots of water, lots of ice. And then once it passed, we would just talk as normal and have a conversation to get my mind off things. It was, it was quite a unique moment to be in and every now and again the midwife would come in and check on me and see how I was going. I will say at this point that at no specific moment in, um, in the birth did any of the midwives say to me, do you want certain pain medication? So I really had to drive that conversation. It wasn't really forced upon me, which I really liked. It also wasn't offered, which was really like, I, I quite liked that because it meant that I could make the decision as to when I needed further pain medication or if I was just fine um, moving through it as I was. So it did get to the point where I actually couldn't bear the pain for a lot longer. I ended up having a hot shower for what seemed like half an hour, but I think it was probably about 15 or 20 minutes where I just sat down, there was a seat, there was no way I could be standing at this point. I sat down in the shower, turned it on to as hot as I could and just had the water running down my belly, running down the back, my lower back and, um, and just really breathing quite deeply and trying to move through it as, as best as I could. Once I did that, I changed into my, my nightgown in which I was going to um, give birth in and I sat back on the bed and it really just helped me quite a bit, that shower. So ladies, have a hot shower. It does buy you a bit of time. My obstetrician then came in and she um, examined me and she announced that I was four to five centimeters dilated and was really pleased with my progress. Now, keep in mind, my contraction started at 3 a.m. and it was now 8.30 or eight o'clock. And she told me that I was four to five centimeters dilated and it was moving quite quickly. And so my midwife then gave, gave us a little prediction that we would have a little baby prior to Carol's by Candlelight starting, which was televised that night. So we were so excited and part of me just went, oh shit, that's still ages away. I've got so much pain management to go. So, you know, I mean, we're sort of talking six, six to eight hours and I'm like, okay, all right, I know this process is long, we're just gonna have to work through it. I think at five centimeters, I just called it and I said, I need some pain medication, please. It's now getting to a point where I can't breathe, I can't talk, and I also started throwing up a lot of liquid. So um, what happened was I was given the gas, which is in my vlog, and the gas is hooked up through this long rubber tube to the back of my bed. And what I was meant to do was to breathe the gas in, in through my nose, or in through my mouth, out through my nose, and consistently do that throughout the contraction. 
I was relatively good at the start, but once the pain got really full on, and I mean super full on, I couldn't even breathe through the tube. I Instead, I would just be, I wasn't screaming, but I was just saying, ow, ow, and I got told off a few times by my midwife. She's like, Ruby, you need to breathe through the tube in order for it to work. So get onto it, what's the issue? And I just couldn't concentrate on breathing. I, in my mind, it was better therapy for me to actually say ouch or ow than to actually get the gas through me. Anyway, that was the constant battle of having the gas. And I don't know if the gas actually really helped at all. It did make me very thirsty and it made me extremely hallucinogenic. So I didn't know what the hell was going on. My teeth started buzzing. I was super high. Okay, like you get super high on this gas thing, like you're tripping out balls. And I think at one point the telly was still on and I turned to Mike and I said, oh, the new Bachelor is starting on Tuesday night or something like that. And I mean, I'm freaking dilating like crazy and all I wanted to do was to watch The Bachelor and feel how buzzy my teeth were. At that point I also was given a shot of pethidine because I was really, really curled up and I was throwing up so much again and in heaps of pain. So before I knew it, a shot of pethidine was offered and I said, yes, I'd love that. Again, it did, didn't do all that much, but Mike tells me, I mean, it's probably doing more than I realized because I was still in that much pain, but it's, I think it just knocks the top off the contraction. The pethidine, again, made me very, very sick. I was throwing up a lot again and it just didn't make me feel great at all and I think at that point I was close to being maybe six seven centimeters dilated and that's when active labor really kicks in my contractions would go contraction 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 so four in a row and then I'd have a five minute break and then it would be contraction, 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 contraction. So I didn't have a lot of time to recover. I didn't have a lot of time to chill out. Um, and even the midwife said, geez, like your contractions are really close to one another and it's not giving you a lot of time to take stock and re-energize. I was also getting really sleepy. So between contractions, I would fall into a super deep sleep and then just be woken up with this horrific pain, like crunching pain. Um, so that wasn't great either. Are you okay? He wants a bit of attention, I think. Say hi, Teddy. I just love him so much. <laughs> Pethidine's gone in. It's probably lasted about an hour or so. And before I know it, I'm sitting up on the end of the bed, just in, deli in a delirious state. And I've just said to my babe, I think I need an epidural. I need an epidural. So the nurse came in and I said to her, I'd really love an epidural right about now. The anesthetist came in and gave me a local anesthetic into my spine. And again, my contractions came four in a row. So she had to wait until they were over and then was working super quick to insert the tube and get that into my spine, get the drip into me and get the epidural working. So the epidural takes about 10 minutes to actually kick in. So I still felt major contractions for the next 10 minutes. However, she was amazing. She just put that in there like an absolute pro. I didn't feel a thing. And before I knew it, my legs started going real numb, couldn't move them. And she could see I was in a lot of pain, so I actually wonder if she maybe put in a little bit more to kind of get, get it going for me. Because by the time my obstetrician came back in, she said, Rumi, great news, it is time to start pushing in half an hour. You are fully dilated, and so we just need to get you ready to push at exactly 12.15. And I looked up at the clock, it was quarter to 12, and I just looked over at Mike and just went, oh my God, this is happening. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. 
I couldn't feel my legs at this stage and the epidural is really strange. So whilst you can't feel your legs, you can still move your legs. So I was asked to put my legs up, um, obviously not in stirrups or anything, but just up. And I couldn't do that, so they actually reduced the epidural drip um, by quite a little bit so I could get feeling back in my legs. So within 20 minutes, I could move my legs. I could also feel the contractions again. Um, not that I could feel the intensity of the pain, but I could feel my contractions coming on and the pressure, which is great because that's what you need when you are um, you need to push. Oh, cut. Oh, dear. Oh, spews. Time to push and it was super unreal to feel as though I was about to deliver my baby. And, you know, it was such an incredible experience. I had the midwife on one side, she was holding my leg and she just looked straight over at Mike and said, right, you grab the other leg, let's do this. And so he then grabbed my other leg and I had Mike and the midwife just absolutely encouraging me and rooting me on and saying the most I don't know, incredible things like, yes, you can do it, you're almost there, and we can see the crown of his head, and gosh, it just, that hour went so quickly. I would have been pushing for a good hour, and whilst it wasn't excruciating because most of the pain happens once your contractions are done, it was extremely uncomfortable, but there was something quite relieving about pushing with the contractions that made it a little bit easier to handle. Whilst I had the epidural, again, I think because they've sort of taken most of the edge off um, the contractions and, and whatnot, the drug was starting to wear off and I could feel everything. So it doesn't last the whole time, ladies. And if you want it to, I think you need to say something, but I felt as though it was going to be fine if I just carried on without a top up. It got to the point where the midwife said to me, okay, we can see his head. All we now need to do is get him through that last little bend because babies sort of sit on a bit of a bend and we just need to keep pushing him out so that every time I pushed him out, he would stay out a little bit further rather than going back in. And I could feel this movement happening throughout the last 20 minutes or so and then she said to me do you want to reach down and feel the baby's head and guys I just I couldn't do it I just sort of said no that's fine I'll touch his head when he's out thank you very much and she said all right well would you like a mirror would you like to see his head and again I'm like I don't need to see what's happening down there at all and I still have no regrets in terms of turning the offer down but my very brave boyfriend had a look and he was there down at the business end the whole time and was just, you know, I think it, his experience was just as special as mine and he just said it was absolutely incredible to see his son being born and to see, you know, the crown of his head and, and all sorts of things happen down there as well. Uh, at this point in time, my obstetrician came in when I was just about to deliver and she had a quick look and said, right, we're not very far at all. Couple of pushes and Teddy will be in this world. Um, so off we went, I had a couple of big deep breaths. I pushed, 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 and then before I knew it, I could hear a little snip. So um, that was when I knew that I had an episiotomy, um, which, you know, again, I couldn't really feel at the time. There was so much going on. Adrenaline was rushing. People were, you know, just getting things prepared in the background. I could see that they were warming a bed for Teddy. Um, I just wanted him out at this point in time. So I had a little snip down there, which was, you know, I think necessary because within about two pushes, he was out and I could feel the pressure come out of me. Like it was just this gush of pressure, which was released from my tummy. It was the most incredible feeling. Um, and, and as you know, they do put him straight on you. So skin on skin. At this point, Mike had cut the cord, which I didn't get to see because there was so much going on. The midwives were cleaning Teddy just a little bit. They do leave a lot of the birth juice on him 
and they leave it on there for quite some time just to nourish the skin and to protect it. So um, by the time I had Teddy on me and they'd cut the cord, I, was man I managed to bring him up onto my chest. Now, one thing which absolutely scared the living lights out of me, and I know, I knew this, I knew this going to birthing classes, but I think in the, in the moment, you just don't really think about it that much, but he actually came out purple and blue, and he was relatively quiet, so he wasn't screaming at the top of his lungs like you see in the movies, he wasn't a pink baby, he was purple and blue and quiet. And at, look, I think at this point they'd established that he was breathing, he was fine, but they did need to call in a paediatrician to come and look at him fairly quickly. And they did just that. So they took Teddy off me at that point in time and they did a couple of checks. And at the same time, I was getting worked on down south in my lady bits. So after you have the baby, you are supposed to also deliver your placenta. So I had a bunch of, I guess, medical staff looking at me down there I had my neck crane over there trying to look at Teddy and I couldn't quite see him. There was too many people in the room. Um, Mike was over with Ted and I just I got so overwhelmed. I actually just thought the worst and, you know, I think as a new mum, you've just been given something that's been so precious and then it's been taken away from you and, oh, it was just, it's just a horrific few minutes and Mike came over and said it's fine it's fine the pediatrician was really encouraging and she just said look he's absolutely fine there's nothing to worry about he's just swallowed a whole heap of mucus when he's come out um, and it just means that he's not yet been able to really voice um, or scream as as most babies do so um, they did have a quick look and he was he was absolutely okay but he was a very quiet baby coming into this world and he's still relatively chilled out and relatively quiet baby so perhaps that's just Teddy style and I'm so happy that that all worked out. Now to add to the drama as well, just when you think the birth's over, I did mention earlier that I had a few people looking at me down south and that my umbilical cord was quite short, meaning I could only have Teddy on my tummy, not on my chest. What happened was, was that my placenta was sitting quite high and it was sitting quite, at, sitting at the back of my uterus wall. So, hence why the cord was quite kind of stuck in me, if you like. Now, they usually give you an injection in your thigh which helps pass your placenta out within five minutes of having the baby. This had absolutely no effect on me whatsoever. And this meant serious business. My obstetrician came up to me and said, look, this is what's happening. Your placenta is really high. We need to get it out ASAP. I'm just going to step outside of the room and change my shoes. And I thought at that point, okay, so she's wearing little kitten heels and she's going out of the room to come back to her flats. This has to be serious. And um, she also questioned me as to whether or not the gas worked, the, the gas when I was in early stages of labor. And I said, no, not really, why? She said, oh, look, you might need it for this next little bit. And I said, well, why would I need it? She goes, because we need to go in and get your placenta. And I asked her, what do you mean you need to go in and get my placenta? And she said, exactly that, I need to go in and get it. Oh, God, so I braced myself for the worst. Mike's come around at this point and he's got my hand and my obstetrician's just put on the glove and she's lubed herself up. And before I know it, she is absolutely elbow, almost elbow deep, um, fishing around inside of me down south, trying to find my placenta, which was sitting again quite high up. And guys, I mean, wow, the pain of that was so much worse than the birth. I mean, so much worse. I could not wish that on my worst enemy. I, the drugs had worn off. I just delivered my baby. I've had an episiotomy. There's been a lot going on down south and now I have my obstetrician's arm inside of me fishing around for the placenta. It would have been a good 20 minutes or so when she did finally get, get it out and at that point in time I was so passed out almost with the pain that I think I said to her at one point, just stop and put me under general anaesthetic. Please just stop. 
I'm happy to go to theatre to get this placenta out. And she said, I know, lovely, I know, but that's just not going to happen. Within about five minutes of that, she managed to get a lot of the placenta out. But what happened was that she was pulling out chunks of it that they had to piece together the placenta to make sure that I was absolutely in the clear. And not only that, she had to go in once again to double check that my canal was completely clear of it. So in she went and I think she apologized about 50 times just saying, I'm so sorry, sweetheart. This has to be done. I'm so sorry. And this whole time, Teddy's still in the corner with the pediatrician and I honestly could not believe my luck. Just when I thought I had a relatively easy birth, there's the afterbirth. But once she was done, oh, I had Teddy back on my chest and she started working down there and I could see she was stitching me up, which just, it took quite a bit of time to get my stitches done, but I didn't care. I mean, I had, I had Ted on me. I had my beautiful boyfriend. I was getting fixed. The birth was over. And I think, you know, the rest of that hour just absolutely flew by. I couldn't stop looking at him. He was just so perfect. I was looking at his little legs and his little arms and his face and, Gosh, you know, I think from the minute you see your son, you sort of think, oh, how much of, how much does he look like Mike and how much does he look like me? But in reality, they just look like a big squishy face ball of cuteness. Um, so that's about it in terms of my birth story. I hope you guys really enjoyed it. I know when I was pregnant, I loved fishing around for everyone's birth story just to get myself fully prepared for the experience. I'd love to answer any of the questions that you have or concerns um, or any queries. And <laughs> here's Teddy. Here's my little Teddy. He's so gorgeous, guys. Oh, he's back in. He's back in. Oh. Hey, say hi with your little angel wings. Hi guys, hi YouTube. <laughs> so hopefully you won't spew again. But please let me know if you um, if I haven't covered off on anything. Otherwise, subscribe or follow me on Instagram at Ruby in Real Life, and you'll see plenty of photos of me and this little guy. Alright guys, take care and all the best with your delivery. Bye!